So unlike most of my talks, this is not a technical one. Actually, unlike all my talks, there won't be any live coding in it, and actually there won't be any code in it. But it's about something I hold very dearly, web standards. I became passionate about web standards since I first heard what they are, and last August I joined W3C to help with their mission. So I think developers should know more about how the standardization process works for a number of different reasons. Uh, not only to contribute uh, feedback, ideas, and make them move faster, result to better standards, because that's what we use every day, but also to follow standardization and exercise some degree of control over the decisions being made, because they affect what we do, and they will affect it for many years. So after I joined W3C, people started asking me lots of questions about how it works which is what gave me the idea of doing this talk. These are uh, some of the questions I get. And if you find by the end of the talk that your question is not answered, feel free to grab me. I'll be here all day. The first one is kind of easy. Are all web standards made in W3C? W3C makes lots of the web standards we use uh, every day, but not all of them. The ones related to uh, the infrastructure of the web are usually made by IETF, like TCP IP or the HTTP protocol. W3C makes pretty much all the languages we, uh, we use daily, except the JavaScript core, which is basically ECMAScript. And it's ECMAScript because it's standardized by ECMA. However, most of the APIs we use, like XML HTTP request, or DOM APIs, or selectors API, or local storage, are also W3C. And that's why I'll focus more on uh, W3C, not just because I work there, so I've more, more, more closely observed how it works, but also because tons of web standards we use every day are standardized there. So I find there's a lot of confusion about what W3C actually does. People don't ask me exactly this question, what w does W3C do? But they often tell me things or ask me questions that reveal there is some misinformation there. This is what many people believe. All W3C specifications are written by W3C staff. All W3C staff write specifications full time. Tons of people have come to me after I joined W3C, and they were like, how is it to write specifications? And I'm like, that's not even in my job description. So that's a myth. There are tons of people in W3C that don't do specifications. And actually, specifications are not written by W3C. They're written by the working groups. It's the working groups that actually make the sausages, I mean, write the specs. So what does W3C do? W3C just sets the rules. Like, there's a whole process document you can find at this address. If you want to learn more about it, it's very detailed, probably more detailed than you want to know. But Every question you might have will be answered by that. And W3C also coordinates the process, oversees what's going on, uh, schedules the, the events like TPAC every year. And W3C also makes tools and promotes education. For instance, we, we held W3Conf here in San Francisco in February. And there's the validator, uh, the CSS validator, the HTML validator that started in W3C. And W3C also organizes workshops, that kind of thing. By the way, this is the logo for W3Conf, and I'm really proud of it because I designed it. So since it's W3C working groups that make the standards, what is a working group? What is it made of? What kind of people are in there? Is it just W3C staff? So a working group is basically member companies, which is uh, companies like browser vendors, big websites, or any other companies like uh, research facilities, or companies like Adobe, or hardware companies like Intel, anyone that, that has an interest in web standards. And this is actually how W3C gets the funds to operate. Unlike other standardization um, bodies, for instance, ISO. Have you, I guess you've heard about ISO standards. ISO standards are not free. You cannot like, go and read an ISO standard. You have to pay for it. So W3C manages to keep standards open because it gets the funds needed to operate from these companies, 
they pay like a yearly subscription. Uh, obviously, working groups have W3C staff in them, but we'll see soon what percentage W3C staff is. And some invited experts, which are community members that have showed that they would benefit the working group from being a part of it. And one of the W3C staff members is designated to be the team contact, which brings news from the, the working group into W3C. So I've told you that there's, there are W3C staffers in every working group, right? So you might think that, uh, see, it's W3C staff that actually makes the standards. However, most of, the work, of every working group is actually member companies. Uh, for instance, in the CSS working group, there are like uh, 84, uh, 94 people. 83 of those are from member companies. There are only five invited experts and six W3C staff, including me, which is like 6.4%. In other working groups, it's even lower. It's like W3C staff is like 4.5% or 3.5% in the web apps working group, which is what makes the selectors API or the, the XML HTTP request API or things like that. It's a bit higher in the internationalization working group, but also, so are invited experts. And the HTML working group is special. It has tons of invited experts because practically everyone can become an invited expert. You just file an application. Every single one of you can become an invited expert in the HTML working group. So this is the biggest myth that I hear about W3C. W3C creates standards that browsers have to implement without having any say in it, which is not true. Browsers are like a huge percentage of most working groups. So that's not true. So since working groups actually make the specs, how do they do that? How do working groups work together and make specs? Who writes the specs? Do the 94 people in the CSS working group actually edit the specs? So there are many ways for, uh, for a working group to work together. Uh, every day, we, we have like the mailing lists, uh, or they, they can chat on IRC. Some of them have a wiki that they use to plan events and r register issues and stuff like that. Some of them use the bug tracker. Actually, all of them use the bug tracker, but uh, some of them use it more than others. For instance, the CSS working group uses the mailing list much more than other working groups. And there's a telcon every week wh where people call in and listen to what everybody has to say and speak their mind. And every three months, there's also a face-to-face -face meeting somewhere in the world. Every working group has at least one chair. Sometimes it's two. And usually, there are people from member companies, but they could be any, any working group member. They, they're responsible for coordinating the, the whole process, uh, sending out the agenda before every meeting, uh, making all the important decisions, things like that. And it's the spec editors that actually write the specs. Uh, the spec editors are usually people from the working group that have offered, hey, I want to write this spec. Can I do it, please? And the working group is like, yeah, sure, please do. Sometimes there are, there are spec editors that do like tons of work. Uh, for instance, in the CSS working group, there's uh, Tab Atkins and Elika Fantasai. She, they edit like 90% of the, of the specifications in CSS. And there are other spec, spec editors that have other things to do, and they're busy. and they don't do as much spec editing as, as was expected. So the specification might stall for years. That's what happened with uh, CSS transitions and CSS animations. And I think CSS transforms as well. Eventually, they changed editors. But sometimes, when a spec takes too long, it's not necessarily W3C. It's, the only thing the working group can do is change the editor. We can't like, push the editor to work more on the spec. So I'm sure you've heard about maturity levels like working draft, candidate recommendation, things like that. What do they actually mean? When is a spec ready? Everything starts from an idea. Somebody, uh, you or a browser vendor or anybody, suggests something to a working group. 
There is some amount of healthy debate. Let's not forget the very common saying that standards are to peace and standardization is to war, but eventually the war ends and peace comes. So there can be three possible outcomes, basically. Either it's accepted, and it, it, the working group plans to add it to the spec at some point, or it's rejected. That doesn't happen very often. Or it's just forgotten, like the, the discussion stalls, nobody, nobody bumps it, and that happens way more often than it should, um, unfortunately. So if, if you get involved in a discussion like that, maybe you should try to like, remind people, hey, will somebody reply to me, please? So assuming it gets accepted, eventually it will get into an editor's draft, which is like the first stage. Every feature goes from that stage. It's not a spec yet. You can't call an ed editor's draft a spec. There can be all kinds of crazy things in editor's draft. Nobody checks what goes in there. Uh, any editor could add things there that the working group never approved. So it's a mistake when people give editor links to editor's drafts and they're like, please implement this browser X. Eventually, the, the working group will review. Uh, the, the whole working group is supposed to review the, 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 the editor's draft, but usually it's a few members. And we will get a first public working draft, which means the, sp the spec has actually started to mature. It's more accepted by, the, uh, by the, the, the working group, but it's still not there yet. We don't usually get implementations uh, at that stage. There are many more iterations. Uh, we get feedback either from the public or from working group members, and there are multiple more working drafts, which are obviously not first, just working draft. And eventually, at some point, we decide that, hey, this, this is good enough. Let, let's move on. So there's a last call working draft, which basically tells people, please give us feedback, because this is going to move forward, and then you won't be able to. Last call usually lasts about uh, from three weeks to maybe like two months sometimes. Uh, so it is quite enough time for people to give feedback. Um, as you notice, the, head, the heading here says uh, last call working draft. That's a new thing, and it's a great thing, because in the past, last call working drafts w were just like working draft, and you, you didn't know, is this a last call? Should I give feedback, or is it just any other working draft? So eventually, we get a candidate recommendation, which means the actual specification is pretty mature and the implementations can start to happen. Although sometimes they happen from working draft stage, but the candidate recommendation is where implementers are actually invited to start implementing it. And to move forward from candidate recommendation, we need two things. Tests, which we'll explain a bit later, and Two interoperable implementations, like two different engines, not like Safari and Chrome. Uh, well, Chrome is now Blink, so yeah, that would work. Um, it's hard to keep track with these things. So we need two, at least two different implementations. And the whole purpose of that is to know that the specification is good enough and they, it, it can be implemented. Because you know, specifications can have bugs as well. Writing a specification is a lot like writing code in in natural language, if that makes any sense. So once we get tests and implementations, we can advance to proposed recommendation, which is like a semi-final stage. I, I've, n I've never heard of any spec that reached proposed recommendation, didn't reach recommendation. And it's just like a last stage for people, for the, the advisory committee, which is like people, uh, uh, the, the, the head of every uh, member company to register any objections, and eventually we move to recommendation, which is the last stage. It doesn't mean that the next version of the spec should happen now. It could happen at any stage before, like Selectors 4 started being worked on when Selectors 3 were, was still at like e either candidate recommendation or even working draft, I don't remember. So a spec doesn't need to reach recommendation for the next version to start. A question I often hear is, how can I keep up? There is a lot of things happening, so what do I do? The good thing is that W3C is very transparent. At least these, these years. In the past, it wasn't that transparent, but now, uh, the past, for the past few years, it's been very transparent. Pretty much everything is public. 
Mailing lists are usually public, at least the ones where working gr groups actually have the technical discussions. W3 specifications are free and public, which is not the case with every standard. By the way, you don't need to keep notes. My, my slides are online. Um, Telcon and face-to-face -face minutes are public, even though the, telcon and the telcons and face-to-face -face, uh, meetings aren't. And oh, quite often, face-to-face -face meetings are open to auditing. So one way to keep up is follow these, uh, the mailing lists where everybody, everything gets posted. Uh, you can find all the standards uh, and drafts in, at this link. <coughs> and if you don't want to read standards, this is a new effort by W3C, along with a number of different companies like Adobe, Facebook, Google, HP, Mozilla. And it's, it's an effort to document the web along with the community and create like, the best documentation that's, actually, that's vendor neutral. Uh, if you've heard about it and want a sticker, I have plenty with me, so just find me afterwards. Uh, and here's a new site that is not related with W3C at all, but I quite liked it. It's how to keep, how to keep up to date on front-end technologies. And it has like lots of different ways, conferences, people, stuff like that. 